Okay, well, it's just about one o'clock. Um, this mic seems so hot to me, so I hope you guys can hear me well, because I'm really almost whispering, which is kind of cool at an event, because I've actually almost lost my voice the second week in a row. Um, okay, so this session, um, so I'm Dave Potter. I work with Citrix and Netscaler, and this session I'm going to talk about how Netscaler integrates at a developer level for DevOps using some examples with our APIs, specifically to Cisco ACI using the APIC API interface, northbound. So at the end of the demo, uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll give a demo on how to use those two APIs, one using our product and one using ACI to stitch together a layer two, three, and a layer four service profile to support an application in the solution that I'll be talking about. So I'm a technical marketing engineer for Netscaler. I've been with Citrix four years, and previous to that, worked extensively with automation on the Nexus 7K for about six years at Cisco. So I'm very adept in the data center industry and very adept at doing automation with the ADCs. This level of presentation, I just want to be forewarning here, would be what something I consider to be a four-level uh, discussion. So what I'll be talking about is how to use something that's available today and how to access it and make this usable at a programmable level. So I'm not going to cover too many high-level topics here. I'm going to go down deep to show exactly how you can do these integrations functionally. So if you're an architect or an engineer, this may be just what you're looking for. If you're an SE, this would give you some idea that there's actually some things working that have been tried out and true and are baked together. Um, if you're just looking for a high-level integration to see what we're doing for DevOps, this may be a little deep, but Bear with me if you uh, have any questions. Uh, we have a very small audience, so I'll be happy to pause just to make sure that we're all in sync and understand what's going on. All right, with that, I've got a number of topics I'm going to cover. I've tried to break it up into modules so that you can sort of mentally compartmentalize what's going on with each area. The demo is at the very end when I show how our two APIs, both the Netscaler and the APIC, work together. So I'm going to start off with the way that we integrate with ACI, and it's a little bit different than other people do this. Um, yeah, I think you, if you know about a little bit about Netscaler, just curious, show of hands, does anyone use Netscaler or heard of Netscaler? A few people? Okay. So Netscaler is an application delivery controller, and the way that we integrate within Cisco ACI is under the L4 services area. So this is where you would integrate a firewall as well as ADCs. We're under the ADC umbrella. So we have a device package, and we have three different operating modes within ACI. The first one shows us sitting next to, plugged into ACI, but not controlled by ACI itself. In this example, I'm showing our Netscaler mass being the manager for Netscaler, but you could just as well go directly to the device. This would allow you to do something like take your existing Netscaler, plug it into ACI, and when you're ready to move the management over into mass or to use APIC, then you could do that gradually. You don't have to basically start over from green, uh, from a green or brand new deployment. In the middle, I have the service policy mode, and this is where we're very unique and different, and I'm going to, in fact, the whole demo really focuses on what we do here that's very different from everyone else. In service policy mode, you would make, make APIC the central manager for all of your net scalers and all of your switches. So in this mode, your single console becomes APIC. Whether you're using the API of APIC or using the GUI, you can configure absolutely everything in Netscaler that you could otherwise do by going directly to the device or using Netscaler mass. Now, there's some automation that you gain and lose by making this transition to APIC as a central manager. We're finding that even though we started our first implementation with ACI with the service policy mode, we're finding that most people aren't quite ready to put all of their L4 services into APIC and have them controlled by APIC. So in answer to that, we've introduced our newest mode, which is service manager mode. And this became available with APIC version 2.2 or 2.1, or we'll just say APIC 2. In service manager mode, we make APIC reach out to MASS, and then MASS pushes the configuration down to Netscaler. Now, there's two components here. When a configuration is done in APIC, that's just the layer 2 and layer 3 information. That's your bridge domains, your VLANs, your IP addresses. That goes into MASS, and then from there, APIC says, MASS, I need it to go to a specific Netscaler that's already been configured in the fabric. After that, 
you go into mass separately, and then when you want to add your layer four to seven policy, there's a number of ways to do that. You can either link it to an existing service graph template in APIC to link into your bridge domain there, or you can create a separate, ap separate application independent of that. The difference is whether you want the policies to be linked together and controlled together, or whether you just want to place them on there and manage them separately. So that's how uh, we manage our, our three different modes that integrate with ACI. All of these are programmable. You can either access MASS using its API and or you can access APIC and its API and you can either fully program Netscaler using either of the controllers. We're very flexible there. In fact, we may be the most flexible across the industry. So here's the high-level workflow that it, uh, in terms of the service manager mode. So the first thing that you're going to do in Netscaler Mass is provision your Netscaler out of band. You want to get it up and running, configure your management address, and then get it discovered by our controller. Next, you would add that into APIC, and you would do that by first adding Mass as the device manager, and then second, you would add the L47 device for Mass to, or for APIC to be connecting to through Mass. Finally, the Netscaler instance is then discovered and layer two, three information is provisioned. That information is provisioned when you create a service graph template in APIC and then apply the parameters. And we've done a pretty good job of simplifying the deployment, and I'll go into that in a moment. But we try to really make it easy so that for a network administrator, you can now just say, I want to give access to this EPG. The VLANs are controlled by the fabric. The bridge domains are set up under the application tenant. Um, they don't really need to manage too much other than how the connectivity goes. Um, once that's done, just the basic stuff is pushed down to the Netscaler. Finally, in the last part here, using the, that service manager mode, newest integration, you would then go into Netscaler Mass, and we have what's called a stylebook. And I'm going to go into detail on what that is. But we use stylebooks to access the policy, layer 4, 7 information, and push that down into Netscaler, linking it either to the APIC profile or running independently. Stylebooks allow you to do things programmatically to the Netscaler, like taking an entire set of policies for an application and being able to move it from one device to another if you happen to want to decommission a Netscaler or move it to another maybe lower powered or higher powered device in the network. So now I'm going to talk about how we're a little bit different in our different integrations. So I mentioned that using the full service policy mode, you could configure everything on Netscaler using APIC. I just want to point out, this is our device package and the function profiles that we make visible to APIC when APIC becomes a single manager. We've found in yellow that, yes, most people are just using load balancing in SSL, but we're also finding that we've got a lot of folks using Netscaler that isn't currently managed in the ACI environment, and they're looking how to do that. The simplest way for those people that are ready to mold, move all this into a unified DevOps team is to access the additional device or function profiles here and to be able to make the app work that way. Now we have an ACI migration tool available on Citrix.com that would allow you to take your existing Netscaler config, break it into service functions, and then put that back into APIC via the API. So we break the config into XML, and then you can post that back into APIC to add your L47 service parameters under the right EPG to support your application. Now we have some deployment guides and templates available already for common enterprise apps like Exchange and SharePoint. And we do have a GitHub repository and a developer forum where you can collaborate to create other application templates, say you've made one for Blackboard or, or Backboard or some other application, and you find that useful that you might want to contribute to the community, we do have that available as well so that you're able to get your applications up and running, maybe even customize something that's in production. And if you feel like sharing that, we're, we're good there, and that can work with the APIC deployment in Cisco, independent of the ADC at this point. So I just want to show how we line up with the rest of the ADCs that work within ACI. If you take a look on the left, uh, your left, yes, um, Avi has a very different management mode. Basically, they don't allow APIC to become the central manager. APIC just sits on the side. They have their own controller, and they create their own parameters, and they push them down into APIC via their controller. So there's no other thing that you can do within ACI to provision or put information or configuration of your application on an AVI. You have to use their controller. With F5, they have a very interesting approach where you need to use the iWorkflow app in order to generate custom device packages if you want to access any of the service functions other than a basic vServer um, and a basic HTTP vServer or their SharePoint unified uh, template. 
So I feel like the F5 uh, may be missing a little bit here because if you want to get in and fully access the config, you have to upload a custom device package. I'll cover a little bit more detail in a moment. But then when it comes to Netscaler itself, everything is available directly within APIC. And this is really different because now you can go in and say, I want to configure um, a bad load balancing V server. I want to add SSL VPN to it. Maybe I want to add some security like App Firewall. You don't have to redeploy your application. You can just go in, edit the service graph, and add these additional service functions without having to come back and change the device package later on. So this makes it very easy to have one device package manage lots of net scalers, and we have two different device packages is depending on the mode of, that you want to do the management from. So how are some ways to get, you know, I'm talking about our integration here. What are some of the ways that you can really get your hands on and get a feel for this, the way it works? So APEC has been in the dCloud for some time. Uh, we were one of the first ADCs to go into dCloud with Cisco so that you can actually deploy a Netscaler using some XML scripts. Now, this uses all the northbound API using Python scripts. So if you want to see how those scripts work, we have a demo available in dCloud as well do some of our other competitors or other ADCs in the environment. What I want to point out here is we're actually the, up, the only ones up to date to APIC 1.2, and we're currently in the process of updating this a second time to APIC 2.2. Now, 2.2 is not yet available in any dCloud demo, and we've actually been working with our partnership and with the dCloud team directly to make the 2.2 simulator available to us. And we're in the process of migrating some of these scripts to work with the additional functionality in the new APIC 2.2. But if you just want to get your hands on, you want to see how the different uh, configurations work. We have a number of scenarios here, basically configuring basic ADC to putting an ASA firewall in front, doing a single node, multi-node, so that you can feel like, does this work with me? Is it too flexible? Or is it just good enough for me to get, on, get an understanding of Netscaler? So we have that available. I welcome you to go to dCloud, just search for Netscaler and APIC, and this uh, demo should show up for you. Now, ACI and DevOps is obviously developer-centric, and you Really, I think the challenge with this is this model is if you're doing something new, it's going to take a long time to get started because you don't really have the basic framework to go from, or maybe it's too simple to start with. So like other folks in the industry, we've actually created a GitHub repository. It's at this link here. It doesn't show up so well on the page. But if you look for Netscaler ACI POX kit or starter kit, you come to our GitHub repository, and it has all the scripts that we've made uh, used in the dCloud demo. They're available for you to get and try in your own ACI environment. Now, what those scripts do is they do everything from creating the APIC tenant to creating the bridge domains to creating the L47 device and linking it. So if you just want to see how to position Netscaler in a basic greenfield deployment, the POC starter kits are one way that you can go in and get a really good feel for how this integration is going to work. Where does it go? Does, do the policies go into the L4.7 services device? Do they go into the service graph? We model all of that with the starter kit. We have the custom function profiles, but I want to really point out something that's different for us is the YouTube video support. So we have over 13 modules now, some specific to dCloud, showing how to deploy a Netscaler within ACI. That goes from plugging it into the fabric, creating all the fabric policies, and then deploying advanced services on top of that. So I have a workflow se series available. If you were to Google, uh, just say Netscaler ACI workflow, That'll come up on YouTube, and there's, an entire, there's two entire playlists there, one for dCloud and one for the public community. So that would allow you to see exactly how to do this. And I haven't found anyone else that shows start to finish plugging it into the fabric and deploying an application and seeing it up running um, where we have done that today. All right, so how do we want to get this running? So what are we talking about Netscaler, and why do we think it's such a good fit for ACI? So one of the leading products with Netscaler is that one of the reasons why we think we're so um, ingrained here and unified is that we have a software load balancer. Yes, it can run on hardware, and yes, it can be accelerated and do some unique things on hardware. But at the end of the day, all of the features are available in our software form factor. In fact, we're the highest performing software load balancer available today with up to 100 gigs of support on a single VPX. So if you need capacity, just add more cores, and you're going to get an immense scale. Now, we've done a few things to accelerate the I.O. modules here. We've added support for VMX 
XNet 3 drivers in VMware, and we do have SRIOV support. I believe we're the first ADC vendor to do VMXNet 3. So if you're looking to get high throughput, maybe your VMM is VMware, then you may find that the VPX is your best option. It's a very lightweight load balancer to be able to get your hands onto a fully featured rich um, load balancer. Now, we've also introduced another load balancer. So say you don't need full features. Maybe you just need to bolt on Netscale, or maybe you just want it to satisfy a basic high availability VIP. For that, we have uh, what's called the Netscaler CPX, and it runs within Docker containers. So if you happen to be running Docker in your virtual environment, you could also deploy a Netscaler CPX here and take advantage of some of the integration there. Now, CPX is specifically geared for DevOps. So we don't have a direct ACI device package integration today with CPX, but we do allow you as a developer to take advantage of an extremely lightweight load balancer. It does not have to run on its own virtual machine. It would run in the Docker host, and would allow you to be accessed using our common manager, Mass. And again, using Stylebooks to deploy templates there, or by using its API with Terraforms and other developer tools that the folks in this community may be aware of. Finally, the CPX really is about microservices. So uh, you may have been hearing about network function virtualization or virtual network functions. With CPX, we feel that we've really hit the sweet spot here where if you just need load balancing and maybe you have Netscalers elsewhere in your environment, maybe you don't want to take complete management of it, but you want to have visibility of it, the CPX really allows you to put that down, have a very small footprint, give it to your development team or the application team, and yet as an IT admin or an IT shop, you would still be able to see how they're using that load balancer and how the apps are performing using Netscaler Mass. So one of the neat things and one of the demos I've given before is showing basically the developer puts SSL certificates on their own app CPX. Netscaler Mass is monitoring the CPX and it can say, hey, that cert doesn't quite meet the security standards that we want our organization to provide. And it allowed the IT team to be able to go and notify the app team to update their SSL certs. And if they wanted to take it one step further, because they have visibility of the CPX, the IT org could actually just replace the cert with one that's more secure as well. So that's one of the things uh, that you gain by using Netscaler in these different environments. So I don't want to go into too much detail on the app lifecycle here, but basically CPX with Stylebooks makes it possible to create a policy profile for your application and move it between any form of Netscaler, whether that's physical, a VPX in your VMM, virtual machine managed network, or maybe your application-specific uh, CPX that's supporting the application. So using Stylebooks, you basically select which Netscaler do I want to send this to, and uh, the application will follow that device. So back to ACI. The way that we've uh, created our, our support within ACI is to have one device package for fully managed mode and one device package for the service manager mode or hybrid mode. Now, you can upload both of these device packages into ACI. They're not mutually exclusive. The only thing that you need to be care of is when you create the L47 device in ACI, you define which device package you want the device to use. That's it. After that point, it's either fully managed by APIC or it's managed by um, mass with APIC providing the L23 information. Um, one thing I want to say, um, this is actually a typo on my slide, is that all versions are forward compatible. So if you were to put these device packages in and get a newer version of Netscaler running, or maybe somebody pulled in the latest Netscaler, these device packages will work with all the versions of Netscaler going forward from the version of the DP. So we do have older versions of the device package if you want to support older Netscalers as well. So something to keep in mind, you really, we're trying to minimize the amount of changes you need to go and do under the L4 services packages in APIC because your apps depend on that. And when you change that, you have to redeploy all the apps using it. OK, so how is it? Uh, how do you get it, and how do you plug it in? So just under L4 services package inventory, you can go to browse and upload the device package. And now for device manager, for service manager mode, you're going to put in the IP address of Netscaler Mass. And that's really all you got to do to integrate Mass with the service manager mode. How does the service graph template look when we're in the service manager mode? We've really reduced the instruction set, and I mentioned this in the beginning. We've really boiled it down to getting uh, an application deployed. All the ACI administrator needs to know is um, what subnet IPs they want to give to the Netscaler on the outside and on the inside and for a two-arm mode. And we have a way to reduce that further so that if you want to make it you know, just one-arm mode, you're welcome to do that with a different profile as well. 
the name of the style book here in the L23 config will show up on mass. And it's important that any application that you want to support this L23 deployment on needs to share that same style book ID or name. So that's really how we link the layer 2, 3 with the layer 4, 7 later on. So if you want to have multiple apps deployed on top of this subnet IPs and bridged and VLANs, then you would just use the same stylebook name in your application template. Another thing that I want to point out is sometimes it gets more tricky the more managers that you use, and sometimes you're not familiar with the different error messages. And one of the ways that we've tried to simplify this and streamline it is when you deploy a stylebook, and this is a very simple screen for a basic load balancing vServer, we've made it very easy with the calling out if there's a problem with the deployment, maybe there's a conflicting policy, maybe there's another policy with the same name, or maybe this just won't work because the network won't connect to it. We'll prop up the errors right there on the screen so that you can see what's happened, which config segments failed, so that you can come back later and correct the, the stylebook template. This is very easy to see in real time what's happening. It's not like a fire and forget, come back later and see if the status was an error. This is something that you get in real time so that you're not losing a lot of the control that you do with a lot of the automation tools that we have today. OK, so stylebooks. So stylebooks is really our answer with Netscalar Mass in order to be able to manage uh, an application centrally. So what we want to make this possible is for you to take an application, put it into a template, and then just require the most pertinent information to support the application, like what name do you want to give it. And we can expose or hide fields in the template. Now the template's based and built on YAML. So as a developer, you would write your basic framework for the stylebook in YAML, and you would expose or use variables for any fields that you want the owner to be able to give input to when they deploy the application. It also makes it possible to redeploy that application any number of times on the same instance or other Netscalers. And again, because they're running the same code, you're not going to run into problems where one Netscaler supports the feature and another one doesn't, as long as they all have a similar license level. Right? So that allows you to do things like make changes to the application and update it throughout its life cycle. You can have different versions of the style book to support different life cycles of the application as well. Another really important thing that's different with us in the stylebook, and this is very different than iWorkflow, is that we allow you to combine stylebooks. So if you have multi-tiered apps that you want to support, or maybe you have an entire model of services that need to be supported for a complex app, maybe you have authentication, maybe you have a portal, maybe a VPN, and you want to do everything like that in one single silo, it's possible for you to have nested constructs within a stylebook, meaning one stylebook links to another. And that way, when you think of it as a master stylebook, so that way it makes it possible for you to move the entire instance of, a, of an application, not just the vServer, not just this SSL, but the entire application could be under one nested construct. This is very different for Netscaler and different than the rest of the industry, because the rest of the industry, I see one policy, one config, we're able to actually make it possible for you to have a master or overlaying config for everything. Really, that gives you the flexibility and the automation to be able to take the super configs and move them around to your network as you need. All right, so how does the stylebook look? I mentioned it was YAML. Really, we've tried to simplify the amount of fields in here. So for developers, it should be a familiar language. Um, just like Python is a very common language in the field for applications today, we based our, our stylebooks based on YAML and not Tickle, which should be familiar with the network teams. So really trying to make mass layer 4 to 7 strong, and we're really trying to make it familiar with the application owners and the development teams. So for that, YAML's that. Um, in terms of the fields that you want to expose, and if you want to put pre or custom values into your different fields, you're welcome to do that in the template. It's as easy as writing in the values and then saying, is it allowed? Can you make changes to it? Do you want that to be pre-filled? Um, it's even possible to do things using our API, like having a variable here so that when the stylebooks invoke through the API, called a config pack parameter, that these fields could be pre-filled in. Say when the application owner clicks deploy a vServer, maybe that vServer is actually already filled in in the callout to APIC. So if you have, say, your own homegrown tool that you're using to deploy applications, it's possible for that tool to define the IPs to support the app, send them over the API, have them fill into the stylebook, and go out and follow the model all the way down to the deployed device. 
So we've tried to make it a little bit easier in terms of, oh, that's great, so you've got a style book and you've supported an application, what happens if you want to make a change to it? So we've actually added a couple different versions within the style books to allow you to control the different life cycles of the app. So if you need to make a change to maybe a parameter supporting the app or maybe in a nested style book, all you need to do is change the version number up top. If you want to change any of the sub framework of the style book, say you import an authentication style book to do LDAP, or Kerberos, then you can control that as well with the schema version when you import it, and you can define the prefix and the versions of the nested style books. This allows you to do version controlling within the different style books. So it could quickly get ugly, right, if you didn't have a version control and somebody updated the authentication module, which, say, four different style books use for different applications. So this is a way of unifying some of that, and um, we have multiple versions existing on the system. So as your app is updated to support the newer modules, then you could just change its related style book to use the newer module version. Okay, so now I'm going to take a little bit of a, a, a different approach, and I'm going to show our API workflow and, and the way it works. So um, I was at uh, one, of our, one of the other ADCs that does an ACI integration. Uh, I saw their session yesterday, and they had a slide showing how they do this uh, an integration with Postman. So I thought that would be the best way for me to also present some of that. So Postman is a tool. Um, that allows you to access the APIs. It allows you to put in things in the body, post, request, and you can see it very visually as a GUI. I think that's really the easiest way to understand some of the development tools because when we just put it into Python and we show script, there's a lot of work that's being done behind the scenes that I don't think you get to see. So what I'm going to do is show how this workflow runs from start to finish using APIC first and pushing config into APIC and then pushing the config into mass for a basic L407 uh, load balancing V server. And then at the very end, I have a separate workflow with a similar set of instructions, but a lot less, to go ahead and find the deployed style book and remove it from the NetScaler. So start to finish, really, there's only about you know, one post to create the style book, another one to get the ID, and another one to bind it, and then one to remove it, if you boil it down to that. The extra stuff here on APIC is to create things like the service graph itself, the template, and the parameters for the L2.3 service. All right, so I'm going to uh, pause here and switch over to Postman. My voice sounds louder on this side. High resolution, sorry guys. <laughs> um, so um, in using Postman, you're allowed to have collections. Um, and within a collection, I've assigned uh, a couple folders for this workflow. So I have one set of, of instructions to push the config into APIC. Question? Can I zoom in? Ah, I think I got to change the resolution for that. But uh, we can try. And 720. Better. A little better. OK. <laughs> All right, so the first thing that we want to do, and I'm actually making use of the environment variables within Postman, and I use JavaScript to interpret some of the responses to do this. Now, this whole demo took me about one afternoon to do, and I'm not a JavaScript expert. I've used it off and on, so I've used it enough, to, and, and I know how to Google to find the, the nice indexes and libraries so that I can actually figure out how to parse some of the information. So I tried to use best practices as best as I could for this demo. So to log into APIC, this should be very easy to understand. Understand. I'm just sending a, a post, and, and for the APIC side, I'm actually using XML and JSON combined, and I'm using them interactively. For mass, I just use JSON because it's just easier to see the, the key value pairs. So first thing I do is, is go ahead and log in to APIC. Now what that does is it creates uh, an environment variable, um, which I can show 
here. I have some extra variables here just for some debugging, but basically when I log into APIC, I, I pull down the token and I send that token in the subsequent request so that I continue to use the same session. So once I've logged in, I'm going to go ahead and send a service graph template, and that creates the template. Now I'm getting uh, an error in response. Let's see what's going on here. Live demo? Anyone? <laughs> Let me just make sure I can reach the uh, APIC. There it is. So for this demo, I actually had uh, found a bug in the newest Postman. That's, uh, so Postman has two versions. Formerly, it was a Chrome app. And it seems to work very well as a Chrome app. But there seems to be some compatibility problems between the Chrome app and the standalone desktop app. Since Chrome is no longer supporting the Chrome app store, Postman's come up with a standalone apps. And there seems to be a parsing error in one of its uh, JSON modules, bringing JSON down into my, my variables. But I'll go ahead and see if I can do this using a combination of the two. All right, so let's try to log in to APIC here. OK, so here's our, our return information. And again, all I was sending was the, the login. And under my test, um, I'm just checking to see that I got back the token. And then I'm learning that token in my, my variables here. Next would be to create the service graph. And because I got a failure before, I expect to see something better on this version. And it looks like um, everything worked OK, because I'm getting a good test. Now to see what I did here, um, I sent XML to create basically my L47 device and the, um, the connection terminals to the service graph. So basically, I've got my L47 device already in APIC. Now I'm creating a connector for the device selection policies. Next is to create the device selection policies and connect it to that service graph. So we send that. Again, I have some tests basically to see am I getting the right errors and the right codes. In this case, yes, everything came back good. There's really not a lot to show here on the ACI side other than this is all standard things that you would do to create a service graph template. Next, we need to create the, the security contract. Now, I've just done a basic allow all traffic. Obviously, if your application has specific ports, this is where you'd put that in to support your application from the layer two to layer three side. So again, we send it. We're good. Now, this is the service graph that I'm providing. Um, that This is where I apply those L47 parameters to the service graph. So this is the subnet IPs that I'm putting into my two different bridge domains to support this application. So basically, I have a two-ended two app. One's on the DMZ side facing consumers, and the other is facing the servers on the inside. Now, that information, as soon as I applied, was pushed down to, um, to Netscaler Mass. And the last thing that you do is bind the security contract to the service graph. Once that's done, everything goes down to mass. So the next thing then is to go to mass and to link it all up. But before I do that, OK, some uh, connectivity thing with uh, APIC. But before I do that, I want to go into mass and show you where that policy just now showed up that I just created on APIC. So MASS is our orchestration tool for all Netscalers. This is where you would deploy the style book. And within the orchestration category under SDN, we have a category just for Cisco ACI. And here we have the SLB two-arm hybrid mode and showing that it received a network config from APIC, and we're waiting for a style book to be deployed. Now, I have two options at this point. If I want to deploy a style book using the GUI, I just click on it right here. Clicking on this would allow me to deploy a stylebook matching that L23 config. So if you want to stop there, make your automation just on the ACI side, and then have the server team come in and use mass, great. They can automate, get some automation that way. But on the other hand, if you want to do full automation, the next step would then to be go back and have the um, dev tool go and connect to mass. Now, mass is very similar to APIC. Uh, we accept XML and JSON as well. Um, go ahead and log into it. 
and then we just follow the basic workflow. Now what I'm doing second here is to collect a few different things. So what I'm doing here is I'm collecting, um, see if I can get down to the response body so I can show this a little bit easier. But basically, I'm, I'm pulling mass for what Netscalers are available and what stylebooks are currently deployed on them. So what this does is it allows me to see what target instances are available for me to apply the stylebook template to. And what I'm doing is I'm going in and I'm extracting the NSID from this, and then I'm assigning it to an environment variable here called NSTenantID. After that, we're ready to create the stylebook. Now, this is actually not creating the, the template. This is actually creating what's called a config pack. And a config pack is a stylebook with parameters applied. So we're providing just the, the parameters. Now, if you notice, there's an error here. This is the, uh, the post of the standalone app uh, problem that uh, I have where it can't seem to interpret the JSON response from my Netscaler mass. Um, so unfortunate errors with my demo. but. Um, Basically, the config pack, for all intents and purposes, is just the IP address of the servers that I want to support the application and the VIP. And then I provide the application name and then the variable referencing the tenant. And that's all that's really needed in order to deploy a, a basic service. Now, because I got an error, I'll probably get errors for the rest of my workflow in this application. But just to go through to show you what's happening next is to get the, um, maybe I can expand this window a little bit, is to get the ID for the config pack that I just pushed in that returned the error. It actually returned an OK message, and it gave me back the, the ID. But if I wanted to go back and query to see what new config packs are available for me to apply a stylebook or a service graph to, this is the config that I, the, the call out that I would make with that. That would return the list of available config packs to match against the service graph that was deployed from ACI. The next is to ask what stylebooks are, or what service graph IDs are available for my ACI. Now that's the same as the, the screen that I was showing before this um, application so if I go back under the, uh, the orchestration page, so this has an ID that would be referenced in the API. It's not shown on this page. But if I were to go in um, and want to access this, use this ID, I would do it by getting the service graph ID. The very last thing that you have to do is then bind the service graph ID from ACI to the stylebook. And what that does is it links the VIP and the V server to the L23 subnet IPs that were configured and the bridge domains that were configured from ACI. And then the final step is just to do a quick check to see, is that provisioning done, or are you still working, or was there an error? Um, when you send this, you're going to get back a list of status codes for the different jobs that may be in progress on um, Netscaler Mass. Now, I have a, a teardown sequence. It's nothing more than sending in a delete request after we go back and say, what style book is there, and where is it linked? And then I get those, assign it to basic variables, and then push them out. Now, if I switch back, I'm going to switch back over to the presentation, because I've made this a little bit easier to consume um, in the takeaway slides that will be available. Um, they may already be available, or they will be available later today. So. In the takeaway slides, I show the workflow that I just showed in Postman. So you're able to see what sections of code in, in its thoroughness, obviously, on the screen is not going to be a whole lot of value to you. But I want to show that this is an entire workflow in a way to automate your deployment of the application. Now, I did make use of variables, so I actually do call out which variables are pertinent to do the, to support the deployment in the demo that I just did. So if you're interested in following that, you'll be able to see this toward the end of the deck in, the, in my slides. And then finally, the variable that I got on the previous is used in this secondary callout. Finally, I go and check the config packs, get their IDs, link them, and then the last thing is to go ahead and get the status. And then finally, if I'm ready to remove it or redeploy it somewhere else, I can go ahead and delete that service pack. So that's how to do the automation. I think it, I, mean, I was able to complete this in a number of hours in the afternoon without a whole lot of knowledge. So I think this is something that could be very easy for a developing team to consume. And I hope for non-developers, it looks like it's not terribly complex. I mean, not to say that, that it it won't look complex, but just to say that it is 
of able, you are able to consume it, you are able to make use of this, and you are able to do some automation with minimal skill set. So with that, we um, have repositories and packages and scripts available on GitHub. Um, we also have a series of Python scripts there so that you can use the similar scripts that are in the D cloud, whether you want to use the libraries and the, the config libraries or you want to use the existing scripts that we have. Those are available as well so that you could do something similar with your own application deployments. And I think I'm coming up on about my last five minutes. Um, so that's really what I wanted to show, to show how friendly NetScaler is, how complex, uh, how versatile it is, I want to say, and how easy it is to consume from a developer at an API level. So I haven't seen a demo of this nature with ADCs yet, so I'm hoping that it was uh, new to everyone here, and I hope it wasn't too much to, to see, but that it is practical to do as well. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. Or if you'd like to see me after, um, I'll be here for a few more minutes. Otherwise, thanks for, for coming. Question? Yes. Yeah, so in my example, I use the NS root user, which is our default root login to Netscaler. Uh, the question is, do you need to use that, or can you use something else? You can absolutely use anything but NS root. <laughs> we don't prevent you from using NS root. I just put it in there because it's a proof of concept. But certainly, in a, in a real-world production environment, we would expect you to have an automation account created that would have some limited visibility to the device. Um, I didn't show it in my examples, but we do have what's called admin partition support, which allows you to virtualize even a VPX and provide multi-tenancy within the VPX. Within that construct, you, the NS root account would be controlling your admin partition, the, the root partition. In this example, you would change it to be an admin user within one of those tenants. So it would be like tenant one user as opposed to NS root, certainly. Any other questions? Okay, well thanks you guys for, for coming and seeing what I had to share. <laughs>